Welcome to Leadership and People. This is a series that pulls back the curtain on leadership by interviewing CEOs, senior executives, and entrepreneurs who've had large exits. We ask these experts about how they built trusted networks to rapidly grow their companies and what advice they wish they knew if they could do it all again. Today on the show, I've got Ryan Moss. Focused all of our efforts on uh, designing products that address the five leading causes of ladder accidents and knowing that safety training in America has been on the rise and dollars spent uh, keeping employees safe has been on the rise and yet accidents and injuries at the workplace and in ladders is still on the rise. Ryan, thanks for making time. Uh, yeah, great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. So for people who don't know uh, Little Giant Ladders, can you, can you explain to people kind of a bit about what's different about the product and, and maybe some of the uh, success highlights of the business? Uh, sure. We're uh, Little Giant Ladders is about a 45-year-old company. Uh, the founder, uh, Hal Wing, uh, met a German painter who was an inventor many years ago. They became friends. He negotiated the rights for the U.S. Um, our ladder is different in the fact that, or at least the one that we had for many, many years, the one that most people know us by is the aluminum articulating ladder. Uh, it's one ladder does it all. So A-frame, multiple sizes of an A-frame, it's an extension ladder, staircase ladder, lean-to ladder, separates into trestles. So it really is kind of a one ladder does it all. Uh, the company was um, really founded on a toe-to-toe -to -toe sale. So literally uh, at home and garden shows or trade shows, you're in a booth. Do a de doing a demonstration, people walk up, if they have interest, um, you kind of go through the whole clothes and they would give you their credit card and you'd ship them the ladder. And it was really um, rep operated and, and sold the product that way for many, many, many years. Um, we had uh, probably uh, very few dealers, I would say, in the early, very early 2000s. In uh, 2002, we had a, a knockoff that came into the market, showed that it was available at Home Depot for about, uh, I think it was almost exactly half the price, and it sent shockwaves through our company as we had an American-made product, and here was a a knockoff that uh, had hit the market and um, so we went to work on how we were going to combat this. We still had two years left on the patents but knowing the court system decided not to fight it because we would have won but lost all the money in the process and of course at the end of that not been able to do anything to stop them. And so in 2003 we created an infomercial. And most, a lot of people that know Little Giant uh, recognize us for our, the time that we had on an infomercial. And um, that's a, a piece of our history where things went really, really good. We um, had a wildly successful infomercial. Most infomercials fail. One in a hundred work. Uh, we were incredibly blessed and ours was wildly successful. And so the first year of running the infomercial, we, uh, I guess I'd maybe back up just a little bit on that. I don't know how much you want to, how much of this story you want to hear right now, or if you really wanted to just focus on what's different about our product. So you tell me, how far do you want me to get into that? Well, I'm just thinking for the, for the, you know, people across the world who, who might be listening or, or even just across the country that may not be familiar with you. You know, they may not think of a ladder company as being super successful, but you guys have made a huge dent out there. And so just uh, giving people a bit of a sense of like, you know, what somebody might think of as a small little ladder company is actually a force to be reckoned with. Um, well, I probably maybe just kind of quickly zip through the rest of the story that yeah, will yeah. Help really help answer, answer that and how we got to where we are today. Um, so... This idea of creating an infomercial sounded well and good. We're used to demonstrating in front of people, and we figured, hey, what if we could just do it on TV? 
it's probably best we didn't know uh, what we know today, which is that they rarely work. Uh, we didn't have any money for the infomercial. Uh, the founder of our company, Hal Wing, literally bet the farm because he had a little farm that he leveraged to get the money. <laughs> he spent a uh, spent million dollars we didn't have to create an infomercial. Uh, of course, this brought new life to all of our employees. People were excited. We're going to make it. Uh, we had salesmen prior to this say, there's no way I'll ever be able to sell a ladder again because I'm selling at double the price of one that's in Home Depot. Uh, we did our first airing, and uh, at the end of the day, of course, everyone was excited. And um, the first airing, we received four phone calls and sold one ladder, and everyone was deflated, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, then people again, like, oh boy, I got to find another job. This isn't going to work. Um, we, as I mentioned, spend a million dollars we didn't have and eight months time doing this. And it's what appeared to seem like a flop really wasn't. Um, fortunately, somebody who knew the infomercial business said, hey, you closed 25% of your calls. That's not bad. So we went to work again. We tweaked the show and it was wildly successful. We grew by five, or excuse me, 600% that year. The next year we grew another 500%. Uh, we were um, incredibly successful. It branded Little Giant globally. Uh, I travel across the, the, the country and around the world and people recognize the Little Giant brand and most of that's from the infomercial. Of course, that also drove retail. We were side by side with the knockoff in Home Depot, selling at double the price and wildly successful there and many other places such as Bed Bath and Beyond and linens and things and places you wouldn't expect to see ladders because the infomercial was so successful. But like um, all successes or even your favorite rate, uh, song on the radio, if you listen to it 10 times today, next month, you'd change the channel if you heard it. And the same thing happens in an infomercial. Uh, at, after a few years, that success started to wane. And of course, retail went away after that. We had um, shortly after that run, 2008, not only did we lose the infomercial, lose the retail sales, but we also lost the general contractor in the Great uh, Recession. And so it was time for Little Giant to reinvent itself. And we spent time and money that uh, we didn't have or maybe shouldn't have at that time in uh, learning how to inno innovate. And we went through the innovation process and learned a very valuable mistake there is that you don't just innovate for the sake of innovation. You uh, innovate to fill a need. And of course, we didn't recognize that at the time and had some really, really cool products that nobody wanted. <laughs> and so um, we don't make those products anymore. During this time, I personally had kind of gone through this little, uh, I guess, career crisis. I, I started with the company in uh, early 1984. And so I've been here a long time and, and really wondered, what am, what am I doing or what are we doing as a company? Um, there has to be more to life than just getting up, building ladders, selling ladders. And I stumbled across a book by Simon Sinek called Start With Why. And I love the book. Uh, Simon Sinek is one of the great minds of our, of our time. Absolutely love the book. I ask our management team to read it uh, with me after I had finished. And so we went through and each week we'd get together and go through the book and ultimately went through the process of discovering our why. If you don't know the premise of the book, it's that people uh, don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And um, so we thought we'd go through the process of discovering our, our why. Um, we failed miserably the first time. Uh, we thought our why was chasing excellence. Um, and we had all the rationale in the world for why that made sense, that you're in a hurry and excellence is not achievable. So you'll always be, you know, trying to obtain, you know, be better than you possibly can be. And anyway, it sounded good. We rationalized it, went on our way. A couple of weeks later, I was about to board an airplane and 
I just, I couldn't do it because when I heard that, I couldn't feel anything. Um, and if you're, if you can't feel your why, then you don't have the right one. And so I called our uh, head of marketing and just said, Hey, I can't do this whole chasing excellence thing. I don't feel anything. And there was a long pause and he said, I'm so glad you said that because we're, we feel the same way. There is, there's nothing there. So we went back to reading the book again and we went through it again. During this time, uh, I'd started to listening to a lot of people because of this innovation snafu we'd had, listening to a lot of people in our industry. And sp particularly uh, those that were in the safety uh, realm. And I learned a statistic that, that I just couldn't believe, and that is every day in America, there are 2,000 ladder accidents and uh, 100 of those that are involved in those ladder accidents suffer permanent disability. And there's a death every day in America on a ladder. And I thought that's impossible. How could have I never heard that? At the time, I was a board member of the American Ladder Institute. I'm currently the president of that group, but nobody was talking about that. And uh, when I learned that, um, I was shocked, somewhat embarrassed to be part of an industry that found that acceptable. And uh, so as we went through that uh, process of going through that start with why again, and what we'd learned when we finally came to our why, which is preventing injuries and saving lives, there was no rationalization. It was something we felt, not something that we had to say or or to, to justify verbally or in our minds or anything. And that completely changed uh, our company. Um, every decision we make now is made with that, uh, with that why in mind. So if you come with an idea and you say, hey, I want to do X, Y, Z, um, we say, well, is it going to prevent an injury and save a life? And if it is going to lead to that where it will further the discussion. If it's not, it's the end of discussion. And so all decision making has become very, very easy for us. And of course it reinvigorated our employees because now they have a reason to get out of bed. Imagine thinking about this one guy that's not gonna come home today. If we could affect his life, if we could make sure he got home to play soccer with his kids or go to his daughter's piano recital or just spend time with his wife. That'd be a cool reason to get out of bed and go to work. And so every product that we uh, build now has to prevent an injury and save a life. And so we've focused, and I'm, this is a long answer to your question on why we're different, but we have <laughs> focused, great though. Great answer. focused all of our efforts on uh, designing products that address the five leading causes of ladder accidents and knowing that Safety training in America has been on the rise and dollars spent uh, keeping employees safe has been on the rise and yet accidents and injuries at the workplace and in ladders is still on the rise. There has to be something more than just those, uh, the, the training, there has to be more than education and we believe that it is through innovation, through product that is designed to protect the user from himself. Uh, a quick example of that is we've all watched Christmas Vacation and we all know that, you know, if we're going to, we call it Griswolding, right? We're going to jump the ladder to the side versus get down, move the ladder. And, and so what do we do? We overreach. Um, that's a huge, that's an innate human nature type thing. And so as we talk to major companies like Comcast and Coca-Cola and ExxonMobil and all that, we... Uh, many, many companies have shared what types of incidents they've had, had and we've addressed those incidents uh, through design. So we have an extension ladder that has outriggers that levels. And so even if you do overreach, which we tell people not to, and we know they're going to, it prevents the ladder from tipping over. And so I could go on and on about all the innovations, but for us, when you talk about what's different, the people are different, the product's different, our why is different, but in the end, what's most important to us is that we're, uh, we're here to get people home safely at night, and we're finding great success in doing that. Our competitors are all looking at how can they make the product cheaper, 
Um, so, and they've really made the ladder into a commodity, and we feel that um, ladders are not commodities, that they are life-saving devices. No one would ever rush to Amazon uh, online to find the cheapest parachute they could find on a Black Friday sale, and yet you find people trying to do find the cheapest ladder they could possibly find uh, on a Black Friday sale. For what reason, I have no idea, because far more people are killed in ladder accidents than parachuting, but, but uh, we just feel differently. We feel like there's a whole blue ocean in, um, in the product, uh, ladder product category, even though it's maybe one of the oldest categories on earth. The ladder was invented before the wheel, who knows? Adam and Eve may have used one to get the fruit, <laughs> up the tree. but um, but we feel like there's a, a whole huge opportunity to reinvent the category with the consumer, the end user in mind, and ultimately uh, try to get them home at night. The yeah. Long answer. I'm sorry. No, but it, it covers so much. Um, and you know, in in part two of the episode, I really want to dive into some of those concepts. Um, before we before we end part one here, um, let's go maybe a different direction for just a minute. Uh, what's what's a piece of advice you wish you could go back and give a younger version of yourself? Um, you know, one thing that I've thought about quite a bit lately is I think I maybe didn't take enough time to. Um, smell the roses, so to speak, or to enjoy uh, the process as much as I, um, as I should have. I went the first 16 years of my career here at Little Giant without taking a vacation. Um, I went the first 30 years without taking a sick day, and trust me, I was sick. Um, and so I think that was, a, uh, I believe that was a mistake. Um, I think I perhaps took it. Now, I, I could weigh that out and say, well, I started in manufacturing, sweeping floors and punching rung, and today I lead the company. And so did that lead me to, um, did that lead me to where I'm at? Probably. Um, but I still don't know that it was the right way to, the right way to do it. And so I would say to probably not take things, uh, quite as um, you know life and death or ser seriously and maybe enjoy the process a little bit more that would be one of those uh, pieces of advice I would give myself yeah you know it's great I think um, especially for ambitious people it's it's really easy to hyper focus on one thing in front of us right yeah yeah far too often okay well, I think it's a great place to cut off for, for part one of the episode. Everybody, please tune back in. We're going to hear more about uh, these experiences from the shop room floor to CEO of a big multi-million dollar company. Hi, my name is Logan Wilkes and I'm the CEO of Corporate Alliance. A few years ago, I moved to San Diego to build a new market for us there. The biggest deterrent I had to success was I didn't know a soul. I often thought to myself, if I just had a thriving network or influence, this would go a hundred times faster. To be honest with you, I had never felt so alone in my life because A, I didn't have an influence, and B, I didn't know anyone that was going through the same thing that I was. If you have ever felt like this and you are looking to grow your influence, join us at one of our upcoming events. You can check us out at corporatealliance.net and request an invite to one of our upcoming experiences.